Hi, my name is Pascal, and I'm from the Robotic Systems Lab at ETH Zurich, and I'll be presenting our work with the title, A General Approach for the Automation of Hydraulic Excavator Arms Using Reinforcement Learning. Let me start right away with the motivation for this work. So the goal is to come up with a controller that can track arbitrary trajectories with the shovel of an excavator. Applications for such a controller are, for example, grading, which means surface leveling, surface finishing, or the precise manipulation of objects such as stones or trees. In this work, we use a Mensimog M545, which you can see here on the slide, and control the four main arm joints. The approach higher is not specifically designed for this excavator, um, but is general enough that it can be applied also to other types of excavators. So the question is, why do we even bother about the data-driven approach? Why reinforcement learning? And the answer is that uh, these tools allow us to facilitate the automation of such machines. In particular, we can reduce the amount of time that we spend on the machine to automate them uh, because our method does not require, for example, joint level gain tuning that has to be performed on the machine. Also, our approach only requires a minimum of machine specific knowledge such that it can be easily applied also to other types of excavators. And also, we do not rely on high performance hydraulic valves but can use standard proportional valves in the pilot stage. And since our method is data driven, we also do not require an analytical model of the hydraulics, uh, which is usually very hard to obtain and also very specific uh, to one particular excavator. So the question is, why is controlling an excavator so hard? And the thing is that uh, such excavator arms uh, have uh, various sources of uh, strong nonlinearities. One of uh, these sources is, uh, of course, the hydraulic actuation, which has unprecedented properties such as power to weight ratio or robustness, but it is in inherently difficult to, to control. Uh, Two-stage hydraulics, which are often encountered in such machines, introduce delays uh, and dead bends. Additionally, usually multiple cylinders are supplied by the same oil pump. This introduces uh, coupling and saturation effects, depending on how many joints are moved at the same time uh, and, then, and at what velocity. And then the conversion from linear piston to rotational joint motion through linked mechanisms, such as the one that you see here uh, in the red circle, is only also uh, highly nonlinear. This conversion can be solved geometrically, but uh, it is cumbersome and needs to be derived for every joint separately. And then since, uh, since such an excavator is relatively large, for example, the arm of the Mensimo can be extended to uh, more than eight meters. This means that the operating and loading conditions vary drastically depending on uh, in which part of the workspace the excavator is used. And on top of that, there is also a lot of friction, uh, which depends on temperature or wear. Uh, so capturing all these effects analytically is very cumbersome, if not impossible, which uh, motivates our data-driven approach. Uh, where all these effects are inherently captured in the data that we collect during operation of the machine. And I'd like to talk about uh, our approach. It consists of, of four steps. So the first step is that we collect measurements on the excavator uh, during operation of the machine. Then in the second step, we train an uh, actuator model that represents the behavior of the hydraulic actuation. And then in the third step, we set up a simulation consisting of the actuator model and the kinematic model of the excavator and use reinforcement learning to learn an end effector tracking controller. And then finally, we, because the simulation is accurate enough, uh, we can directly deploy the policy training simulation on the real hardware without modification. Now I'd like to talk a bit more in detail about uh, these four steps. So let's start with the data collection. Uh, so to collect data on the machine, we basically randomly move the arm uh, to capture all the relevant modes of operation. Therefore, we design the signal that consists of two parts. So one part is the red part here, the red signal, uh, which are ramp profiles uh, that ensure that the joints uh, are moved over their whole range of motion. Uh, and on top of that signal, we add chirp, uh, so a sinusoidal with changing frequency and, and amplitude. Uh, the data is collected. Uh, during 100 minutes at 100 hertz and only for motions in the air. Here you see an excerpt of how data collection looks like. So the two joints closest to the cabin, uh, there the RAM profiles are provided through um, joystick controller to avoid collisions and then augmented uh, with a chirp. And the other two joints are controlled with the exact signal as you saw it uh, before. The next step 
then is to model the actuation with the collected data. The model consists of a simple feedforward neural network and directly outputs the joint states given a certain pilot stage valve command. By computing the joint states directly, the cylinder to joint space conversion is comprised inside the actuator model uh, and doesn't need to be taken care of separately. And then to capture coupling effects, we train one big neural network to uh, model all the four actuators together. Here's some more insights about the actuator model. We use a simple three-layered neural network with the relo activation. And the input consists of the command and the state of the machine, including a history uh, thereof to capture input delays. And these, like the size of the input vector adds up to uh, 194. The output consists of the velocity of the four joints at the time step t plus one. And we let it train for about six hours on an RTX 2080 GPU. And uh, to use the actuator model in simulation, it also needs to be rolled forward based on its own outputs. And to obtain the joint positions uh, at the next time step, we simply use uh, forward integration of the predicted of the modeled joint velocities. And this works actually pretty well. So rolling forward the actuator model based on its own outputs, which is essentially dead reckoning, is prone to drift. However, uh, we only can accumulate little drift even over quite a long period of simulation. So what you see in the top plot uh, in green are the valve commands that have been sent to the machine during data collection over a period of 20 seconds. And then in orange and blue, the measured and the model the uh, joint velocities. The bottom plot um, shows in orange the measured and in blue the uh, joint, pos joint positions that are obtained uh, by integrating the output of the actuator model, so by integrating the, the joint velocity. And this is plotted for uh, one of the four joints. Now that we have the actuator network, we set up a, a hybrid simulation consisting of the learned actuator model and a kinematic model of the excavator. And then we use reinforcement learning uh, to train a controller to provide a means of dealing with the highly nonlinear actuator dynamics and learns to apply the optimal control inputs through trial and error. So the task for the oral agent is to compute control actions that track a random desired linear and angular velocity of the shovel in task space, uh, which is visualized using the red and the blue arrows here. And yeah, for doing reinforcement learning, we use an off-the-shelf algorithm PPO uh, in this case. And so what you see here in the left video is the training scenario uh, where we train uh, the control, where we initialize the agent in random configuration and train it to track randomly sampled and effective velocities. Um, we use relatively short episode lengths of only two seconds, which is a trade-off uh, between giving the agent enough time to achieve the goal and not accumulating too much drift from rolling forward the actuator model. This takes around two hours uh, on the regular desktop PC. And then during deployment, we use a simple P controller, uh, as you see it here on the top right of the slide, to compute the desired end effector velocity given a desired uh, trajectory. For the P gain, we use a value of three for all the three dimensions, and we keep it constant for all the experiments uh, that are also shown later. And then here you can see how this looks like uh, in simulation for tracking now a circular trajectory while keeping the orientation of the shovel relative to the cabin constant. Here on the next slide, some more details about the controller. We use a simple uh, architecture uh, as for the actuator network, uh, two-layered MLP with 10H activation. And the input to the controller consists again of the state of the excavator, which is the same as for the actuator model including the history and the command. The input dimension is only 64. This is because we train the agent uh, at a reduced control frequency of uh, only 6.6 Hertz. The command in this case is the desired end effector velocity. And additionally, to make learning for the agent a bit easier, we also provide shovel position and velocity. The control actions are then pilot stage valve commands. Here you see the controller uh, during deployment on the machine. Uh, all the videos are real-time, so not accelerated. 
and the control commands from the trained neural network uh, in simulation are then directly applied to the pilot stage of the machine without further modification or fine tuning. The controller is not trained to track one particular trajectory, but it can track an arbitrary trajectories in which you circle uh, at different velocities in different parts of the workspace, uh, just because we think these are demanding trajectories uh, because they require coordinated motions of all the four joints, as well as uh, crossing the valve dead zone for velocity direction changes. Then we also perform uh, straight line motions, as it's often used for uh, surface leveling. And then uh, also a more realistic scenario with the uh, soil interaction. Um, uh, we have a trajectory that consists of four hard-coded wave, uh, hard uh, waypoints, which are connected with straight lines. And the controller, the learn controllers then used to track those lines. And what is nice is that the controller generalizes well uh, to the scenario where it experiences light disturbances at the end effector, even though it has never been uh, it has never experienced this uh, during training. So to give you also some idea about the achieved accuracies, uh, here are some numbers. All the numbers are reported here are averaged over five trajectories except for the grading experiment. So for the circular trajectory, the average error is two to three centimeter with the maximum error, error of four to seven centimeters depending on the end effector velocity. And then to see if the accuracy is even useful for practical application, we compare it to a commercially available automation system from the company Leica. Uh, it took Leica engineers roughly one day uh, on the machine to calibrate and tune their system. And as their system only actuates three joints, we train another controller that also only actuates three joints to make a fair comparison. Uh, the results are shown here and they show that um, our controller is slightly more accurate with a uh, slightly lower maximum error, which uh, indicates that the achieved performance is actually useful for practical application. And then also for the grading part, the error is not significantly larger than what it was uh, for the other trajectories. So to summarize our approach, we have a controller network that has been trained uh, with reinforcement learning. We have an actuator network that has been trained based on uh, real measurements that have been collected on the machine. Um, the joint, like the task space properties of the excavator are computed based on uh, the joint, set up, joint states that are provided by the actuator network in simulation or uh, from measurements um, that are collected on the machine during the deployment then. And finally, to conclude, we have shown how to derive an end effector trajectory tracking controller for hydraulic excavators using a data driven actuator model and reinforcement learning. With uh, only 100 minutes data that we have collected on the real machine, we could come up with a controller that even outperforms a commercially available controller in terms of tracking accuracy. The method does not require cumbersome joint level tuning and is, in that sense, general that it can easily be applied to different types of excavators. It only requires a minimal uh, machine-specific knowledge and customization uh, of an off-the-shelf excavator. Namely, uh, we require knowledge about the distances between the joints. Uh, this can easily be measured. Then we rely on sensors for measuring the joint states and we require an electric pilot stage for uh, automatic control. And by collecting data only during motions in the air, the resulting controller works well also for light soil contact that is encountered during uh, surface leveling. For full digging, however, the approach would need to be extended by collecting data also during digging operation and estimating the joint loads through pressure me measurements. Then the training environment would need to be augmented with force disturbances at the shovel that can be computed, for example, using uh, soil tool interaction models. Thank you very much for your attention.